Welcome to Elite Team Talks, the podcast that simplifies the universal principles underpinning the world's most successful teams. I'm Henry Cheatham, founder of Elite Human Solutions. Join me as we venture into the minds of individuals who have created, led, researched, or been a part of history's most successful teams, from World Cup winning coaches to Special Forces leaders and the minds of Google. We're committed to presenting the most diverse array of thought leaders ever assembled. Through the stories and wisdom of our guests, we filter the noise, extract key insights, and deliver clear, actionable steps for you to build industry-leading teams and culture within your organization. Welcome to Elite Team Talks. Hi, and welcome, everyone. In part two of my conversation with ex-colleague and UK Special Forces Sergeant Major Gaz Bamford, Gaz shares his wisdom on how to create a resilient, high-trust culture within your organisation. He breaks down the crucial components underpinning resilient, high-trust teams and provides intelligent ways for overcoming the constraints often experienced in corporate environments. He also shares what it takes to lead a resilient, high-trust team and the common challenges you're likely to experience when building one. Last but not least, Gaz breaks down the myth that companies can't develop a level of connection, trust and belonging on par with special forces teams, despite a lack of life or death scenarios and far less time together. You can expect to understand how to build and lead resilient high trust teams, how to sustainably maintain high standards within your team, how to effectively manage and even benefit from conflict and how to develop a deep level of connection, trust and belonging within your team. As always, if you enjoyed the episode and want to be the first to hear when new episodes drop, please like, rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. Most importantly, thank you as always for watching and listening. This podcast was created for you and I hope you enjoy the episode. So in regards to purpose, you know, in special forces, building purpose and connection and a sense of belonging almost seems like given what people go through together, it's inevitable. But when trust is a matter of life or death, how did you and your peers cultivate a deep level of connection and trust with the individuals that then joined these already established teams? I think, I think they, they all ties in with what we were just talking about in, in many ways, Henry. The um, trust was an essential ingredient. So therefore, we had to build trust in everything that we did and to build those relationships. Now, it wasn't communicated as such, but by the very nature of what it was that we did and relationships were built through the time that we spent together and trust on the back of that was also um, fostered. So by doing hard, challenging, difficult things, so this is one of the differences that I've seen uh, in, in the military versus uh, a lot of corporate settings, that the amount of training that we would do, I, I would I would argue it's probably an eighty percent balance of training to twenty percent doing operationally, and it's completely unachievable again for most corporate um, businesses to kind of train their people for eighty percent of the time. But th- this is what was necessary for us to build the relationships, the trust, the understanding between us. Now, clearly. To get through the selection process, someone on the face of it thought that this was an organization that they wanted to be a part of. They had to really want it. And that was communicated through the selection process as well. So that when, by the time they're in our organization, they were, they were 95% sure that this is the right organization for them. Um, of course, there's always nuances uh, when they, the reality of the situation, but like we would spend a, a gross amount of time together traveling all over the world on various training exercises, separating ourselves from our families. All of, and, and, for, and for most people, that would be unachievable. But the right person for the organization that within special forces that, that is the, the, the people will are, and are prepared to put up with the, the challenges that that exposes 
um, outside of the work. I always think about the um, James. Are you familiar with James Clear's book Atomic Habits? I, I assume so. Of course, he also James Clear also talks about the concept of four burners. Are you familiar with that concept at all? Mm-hmm. Anyway, no. So he talks about these four burners. Like you think of a cooker top, where you've got work, you've got family, you've got friends, and you've got health as the four burners of all different aspects of your life. Now, special forces demands that a work burner is running red hot. So therefore, friendship burner has to be turned. You know, I, I've got a large circle of friends from school that I still hang around with. But whilst I was serving in special forces, I saw them rarely. You know, we we would touch base. We would, uh, you know, they didn't know details of what I was doing. I was all over the place, but the relationships were good enough that they were maintained. And when I did have time off, we always uh, saw each other. My family, you know, for a large period of time, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have children. So I could manage that one. Partners, girlfriends, wife, etc. you know, struggled through it, but I was, you know, uh, I was purposeful enough and that they understood that the kind of where work sat in in the order of things for me. Uh, my health was as a byproduct of being in that organisation. Certainly, physically, we were very active, so my health was kept up. So that was that was be able to be maintained. I view things slightly differently now with regard to those four burners because I don't want work necessarily to be running red hot and compromising those other things potentially. Right, my family now that burner is is wanting to you know run so much higher than it used to do so there has to be compromises in the burners elsewhere because we're, we've only got so much to give ultimately so but at the time finding people in the organization that were willing to just turn that, that work and health burner up full blast and then potentially to compromise those two other areas of their life they were the people that we needed and they were the people that showed up in the organization those i was always fascinated with the guys in their careers when i first joined that had been there 20 years still had energy still had zeal still had determination in all the things that they did and were very purposeful in what they did at work so i kind of again i've got a background in psychology so i, I was i was watching those people what is it that they did how did they manage their energy levels how did they st- stay engaged and care continually about the things that we were doing whilst also managing their home life and their their health and their friendships outside of work um, and so there's there's lots of things there but i think it's all about these four burners and managing them to knowing how to turn them up and turn them down so when you are with your family let's say to be present and with your family and so the work burner needs to come down and not to be emailing or texting people at work, you're, you're at home for the weekend, give that time to your family and reinvest in them before on the Sunday night or Monday morning, whatever it was, you go back to work and then crank up that work burner. So having these clear divides, you know, I speak to you now from a, you know, I work from home for, for nearly four years, but I've, I've kind of now, I've got a, an office separate from home now, um, nearby about three miles away, but it affords me that ability to have these boundaries and, and I still look at it around these four burners. So purpose, again, can be whatever you uh, tune it into. But I think having you know, an ability to tune things up and tune things down with the various groups of people and circles that you manoeuvre in is, is, is one of the key things that uh, the people that have the elongated careers in any sector, to be fair, uh, again, working with a lot of senior leaders now, in any sector, being able to manage that, that and those four burner tops is is critical Mm. it's um it's certainly a hot topic isn't it with individuals who are inherently ambitious there's going to be sacrifice but just as you said the two most valuable currencies in our lives are time and energy not money so how do we utilize those do we turn up to that small amount of family time that we have being present being you know, nice to be around, being patient, which I'm sure as a, a father of four, you've, you've been tested at times. And, you know, you're, you're very um, humble in saying you've observed others do that. But obviously, you yourself, given your success within special forces, and the fact that you um, still have a functioning household, and you've, you've learned some things along the way. So if you could Describe to individuals who want to be a part of these teams but don't want to totally sacrifice the other areas of their life, 
what it was that you think is most essential, what would you say? So I would say teams like special forces, there's various things to be in special forces. You, you have to sacrifice and understand that there is going to be incredible sacrifices that you have to make with your personal life. So parking kind of people aside from special forces that are volunteers with special forces. So people in the highest performing teams, you know, like I said, I, I genuinely believe um, that it's about managing your time. You know, there is nothing more valuable. Uh, it's being clear in what you're trying to achieve with the, the group of people that you're trying to achieve it with. Now, those groups of people, you know, I'd, I'd hope for people that certainly family, family, men and women, you know, part of that is achieving things with their family and setting clear goals with their family, as well as being really clear in the goals that they're trying to achieve with their work. So my work had really clear goals. We called them missions all the way through my life. I've set smaller uh, micro and macro goals with my with my family, with my friends. We've put things in the diary. We've scheduled time. We want to try and do this uh, with the family. We've, we've got various different holidays that we wanted to do. There's bucket list places we wanted to see. Uh, there's there's things that we want to spend time doing together that we've learned that we like to do together. And so having these written down and communicated with the people closest to you, whether that's your teammates, whether that's your partners, wives, husbands, etc., is vital. You know, goal setting isn't simply about having these work goals that mean you're going to earn so much more money certainly for me for some people it is and that, uh, you know I, I don't judge that's that's for them uh, um again my with my background and experience no one ever joined special forces for the money i can assure you it was never it was never a factor because they simply don't pay you enough um for the risks and challenge that you that you have to you have to face and be prepared to so being clear in your goals Again, communicating them as a team, whether that's your work team, your home team, and, and getting skilled at this. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, uh, I've got a functional family. Again, we, uh, there's lots of friends and family that visit us that would say that it's dysfunctional because of how we, you know, we just, we, we just are always knocking corners off each other to, to fit together as a group of people, as, I guess, especially as the children age, that, um, you know, they're, they're learning about themselves and, and that ultimately... There's frustrations, and but they're managed. They're managed with openness. They're managed with the same pillars of um, the fundamental pillars that we that we used to think about with leadership uh, in the military. To now, I apply to my family. That you mentioned authenticity. We we talk about uh, accountability. We talk about communication and having open communication with something's bugging someone in your family unit. Something's bugging you in your work team having a courageous conversation and and you know, communicating that out and helping each other understand what the issue is is a skill that we've all got to keep learning and getting better at it's an endless game so the longevity to any of this success over a long period of time means becoming skilled in in these things and whether that's your family or whether that's your team so being having a strong purpose is great, but you know, to achieve great things, you need a, a team of people, and, and that means becoming skilled in communicating, holding each other accountable, having you know clear goals in what it is you're trying to achieve in the first place. So it's a combination of all of those things. Nice. And do you have any personal experiences where maybe someone on your team um, lost? trust of those around you or even outside of your special forces um times and in regards to that how have you either seen or um successfully regained trust and what lessons could maybe companies that have potentially low level of trust or psychological safety within their team do to remedy that so the, fir the first aspect to that, I would say, like, we're all imperfect. So people make mistakes and people are flawed and they're flawed in their thinking, they're flawed in their actions. Now, even the very best at whatever they do are imperfect. That's, that's, so that's the, accept that that is going to be the case. Now, whether it's current work that I do now with various teams, the team I work with, my family, whether it's former organizations, people always made mistakes and sometimes made selfish decisions the, 
I mentioned the three uh, pillars that we talk about with leadership or whether it's high performing teams, but it's uh, uh, authenticity, it's accountability and it's communication. Holding people accountable to high standards is that thing. So if, if you observe or believe that someone's done something untrustworthy or so something comes to the light where it's clear that someone's done something untrustworthy, they have to be held accountable to that. Now, that doesn't mean some kind of crazy kangaroo court, but it means in a, in a, you know, if you care about this team and this team's continued success, it means getting people in, speaking to people, not embarrassing necessarily people in front of others. It means having these correct, we talk about it as a courageous conversation with someone. Like learning something like that as a leader is a challenge, right? You go, how do I deal with this? Well, it doesn't mean you're going to be great at it the first time you have to deal with it. You get people in and not in front of other people and have a word with them say, you know, I've heard this, is this true even? And, and let them explain their side of things, their reality. They may accept it they or agree that that's happened or they may deny it. And then obviously then more challenges fall out of that. But ultimately holding people accountable to the standard. So communicating a problem, why that's not acceptable. And as a, as a father, as a, as a dad, um, this is, you get so much practice of this with children. Right? I think, you know, my leadership's been tested so much more with my family unit than it has certainly with special forces because children will be deceitful. They will lie. They will try and get away with stuff, right? They, and when you know full well that they've taken biscuits out of the jar, but they all, they've got chocolate around their mouth, but they'll say, no, I haven't done it, daddy. And you're like, interesting, you know, but then having these conversations, you know, and, and explaining to them, it could be easy to, to, to call them out in front of their siblings and say, look, I can see that, Johnny is, is, is lying because he's got chocolate around his mouth. Does everyone understand that? Look, don't be like Johnny. We could do that. And that's what some leaders will choose to do with their people. But ultimately, we care about our teams, don't we? We love them. So we have to kind of uh, help them to reason on what their behaviours and, and, and separate the people from the behaviour. So just like you would a child, just because a child has done something once, it doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means you don't love their behaviour. And they've got to separate that behaviour from them. So... Um, with regards to high performing teams, it's exactly the same. Just because somebody's made a mistake, just because somebody's lied, just because someone's done something untrustworthy, doesn't mean you don't like them as a person necessarily. You may feel feelings about that, but ultimately they need to, you know, are they prepared to reason on that behavior? Are they prepared to separate themselves from that and realize that, that isn't something that they can continue to do for the greater good of the team or the organization? Does that make sense? Makes total sense. And I think nicely clarifies the difference between interpersonal conflict, which isn't productive, where it's a personality or a certain individual that you don't necessarily agree with or have a, a bias against versus constructive conflict in regards to how you're going about solving the problems or the goals you're trying to achieve and, and differentiating those two. But obviously, there's the caveat, like you've said there, of a huge amount of compassion, empathy and patience to be able to appreciate that to build a team that really trusts each other, you're going to have to go through a lot of conflict. And that's the necessary part of it. But it sounds like how you manage that conflict is largely whether you come out the other side with a higher trusting team or a team that's crumbled. Uh, yeah, I, we we talk. We literally talk about courageous conversations most days. So understanding that to hold people accountable to agreed standards is difficult. So it takes courage to do it as a leader. I would also say that it's about understanding individuals' needs. Again, so we used to do lots of training and time away as a group formally in, in my old organization. And part of that was to understand your team. So you would understand their individual needs. And so that when certain problems were presented, understanding what each individual is going to need in that scenario as a leader, at least that's that's good information to know. I, I, I had former guys before, uh, teammates that I could you know, the least needy people on this planet, you know, you could just say, this needs doing, do you mind doing that? Yeah, fine, they're gone. They don't they need nothing. Then you've also got people that need recognition. 
They need that, that arm around them, maybe. They need that uh, feeling of connection with other people doing it with them. They need that, uh, they need certainty that it's going to be finished by this time, you know, all of those things. And then you've got, like I said, the other end of the spectrum, people are like, yeah, no worries, and off they go. And, and it's like, that's the last year until the job's done, you know. But understanding your team is a vital ingredient there as to what each individual's various needs are. And again, that that's done by spending time with them and getting to know them. You know, we're talking remotely now via uh, Zoom, clearly. It's just not as good as being in person. And remote teams uh, um, and hybrid uh, rem- remote teams are not as, not as, the, the, the lines of trust can't be as strong as when people are spending time together. Now, I'm not saying that hybrid and remote teams don't work. I'm just saying that to build trust, to build relationships, human, real relationships, you need to spend time with each other for sure. And that's, that's you can build trust without, but it's not going to build as quick and you're not going to know each other as well as you do when you're doing things together and, and seeing uh, bigger picture stuff. Nice. So... Obviously, as you've mentioned, it's not necessarily realistic to spend the amount of time that you did with your teammates um, training or even just downtime wise because you're traveling together. But one question is, can companies develop a level of connection and belonging on par with special forces teams? And if not, what strategies can be employed within the constraints that they have to rapidly develop trust maybe to speed it up i'm gonna say they can because like henry special forces aren't perfect that's not the only way to do business for sure i've spoken openly today about how how they do business and what works for them but what works for them isn't necessarily right for every single other organization so every organization has to understand what works for what it's trying to achieve and the kind of people that it's trying to attract to work along with, you know, and that's a, that's a leader, that's a, a founder, that's a CEO's job to, to understand those things strategically and to implement the things that is going to attract the right people to uh, build trust, to build relationships, to do things together that, you know, that bring people and pull thing, people together. So where they want to be there, um, I think in the second part of the question is, you know, what can companies do exactly that? get people together this is this this human need of connection is universal i'm convinced by it there are some people that will profess to be more introverted for sure and i'm i'm you know definitely more on the introverted side of things than extroverted but as everybody needs a connection of some form now some people get that connection through animals because it's less complicated than humans right because being connected with humans all the time, as we've discussed, it causes problems and different people have different needs. Whereas, you know, you get a dog and a dog's always happy to see you, right? Because, but they, but humans still need connection in lots of ways. And I'm convinced that the best teams on the planet, regardless of what their business and industry is, they need to bring people together and to get people doing difficult things, facing adversity together, coming through the other side of those challenges and learning from that. And learning what worked, learning what didn't work, and those people all the time will be brought together and pulled together, uh, gravitate towards one another, and and have lasting relationships and memories over many, 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 many years. So, again, for me, the, the key ingredient is is connection and getting people connected on a way that works for them as a team. You know, special forces have their way. That's not going to suit every single organisation, um, clearly. So, there's elements of that. that there's universal truths and some of that is about time spent together in in rich environments where you're just getting to know one another on a on a better level than you can via email or via video conference calls you know that's not a great trust builder um certainly when cameras aren't off on on as well uh, it's another topic for another day definitely so i guess to summarize if i can so that i make sure i understand what you've said today the first thing we discussed was make sure you're identifying the character and values of the individuals that you're assessing more so than the skills and then secondly understand what each person within your team needs have the empathy compassion and patience to to learn that and then also to create opportunities for connection 
not necessarily to just expect it to happen, even if you've already got people who have been recruited because they have high levels of teamwork innately. Absolutely. And, and, and I'd add, just communicate, over-communicate, keep repeating the, the things that, you, you know, as a leader or as an organisation you're looking for and be clear in that so that everyone understands it. People need to be reminded more than they need to be told. Just because you've said something to somebody once, it doesn't mean all of a sudden that's impressed on them and they're going to do it every single time because people have individual selfish needs. But as a team, as an organisation, just to over-communicate what it is that we're trying to achieve together and what the common mission is. One of the things that always struck me and one of the things I've reflected on my time in the military is there's a, there's a sequence to a set of orders for a mission. And it was exactly the same each time. The nuances are different each time, but the, um, the, the order of the uh, set of orders was, was always the same. But there was only one thing within there that we ever said twice, and that was the mission. The mission was the only thing we ever repeated twice. And we would literally read the mission out and then say exactly the same thing again, just so it was impressed into people what it is we're trying to achieve. Now, that's so that when you're deployed somewhere, when you're out doing something and you're faced with a challenge that doesn't necessarily compute, like what's the mission? What are we trying to achieve? Ah, okay, you've got the boundaries there. And we just have to communicate over and over again what it is that we're trying to achieve because people drift, individuals drift, teams drift, organizations can drift. And just resetting, being clear in what the mission statement is, are we achieving it? Holding people accountable to that uh, is vitally important. So, so, yeah, I think that's kind of summarizes it quite nicely with regards to the mission. That's awesome. Lovely. You summarised some really nice topics today and delved into them. I'd like to finish, if you're happy, with a little word association. So if I can, I'll just read out 10 words, one at a time, and the first word that comes to your head, just shout it out, and then I think we'll call it a day. This is a minefield. Let's it go. really is. It really is. So the first one is values. Necessary. Fear. Expected. Purpose. Crucial. Sacrifice. Again, I'd say necessary. Leadership. Challenging. Failure. Normal. Family. Everything. Empathy. It's huge. Love. Huger. Legacy. Meh. Nice. Thank you. That's brilliant. And, and I'm sure the listeners will enjoy that too. It's not easy, not easy at all. Yeah, no, the, 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 the challenge is not saying things I'd already said. I mean, there's so many things, so many words there, Henry, that are vital, that are so important for individuals, for teams, you know, whether families, you know, your literal uh, genetic relatives or whether that's kind of your, your teammates, you know, it's, uh, it's so important to get in. Um, stuff achieved so yeah nice little test that <laughs> well it's been an absolute pleasure there's so much more we could delve into and i hope we do pick the conversation up again but thank you very much for your time mate and we will speak soon my pleasure henry good chatting take care hey everyone so i hope you enjoyed my conversation with gaz in a job where a lack of trust could mean the difference between life or death it was clear that developing trust was an essential not a nice to have for gaz and I couldn't think of anyone more suited to speak on the topic than Gaz himself, given his experience. So as always, let's use the 5P framework and mental model to break down what Gaz spoke about today and the three key insights and takeaways from this episode. Firstly, purpose. As the first of the 5Ps, I define purpose as how connected your people feel to one, the mission, and two, each other. So why is purpose important? Well, a high level of purpose has been associated with 43% greater revenue in companies, 30% greater innovation, half the employee turnover, double the productivity and a five-fold increase in well-being. Not to mention the fact that Gen Z are the first generation to prioritise purpose over salary. So I think you'd agree it's pretty important. Gaz believes that companies can develop a level of connection, trust and belonging on par with special forces teams, but it requires conscious effort given the combination of less time together 
an 80-20 ratio of operator to training in the corporate world and the remote nature of work these days. Gaz stated that to achieve this, it is crucial to understand and over-communicate your vision, mission and values. I really like Gaz's comment that people need to be reminded more than they need to be told, explaining that the only thing they ever repeated when communicating before operations was the mission to avoid people drifting from it. Gaz also believes that you need to understand your people on a personal level to determine the best way to connect them to your mission and each other, with doing hard things the approach in his world. Interestingly, Gaz stressed that the human need for connection is universal, and this aligns with research which demonstrates introverts and extroverts to require the same amount of connection. As a result, Extra attention should be placed on understanding introverts within your team as it's often harder for introverts to create deep levels of connection due to the increased requirement for alone time to recharge. The second P is people and I define this as having the right blend of the right people in the right roles feeling empowered. Gaz introduced James Clear's concept of the four burners which you can find a link to in the episode description and this relates to balancing your work, friends, family, and health. Gaz spoke about the need to ensure that your hires are aligned with the right balance of burners to fit your team or company, especially given the smaller amount of time available to connect people to your mission and values in the corporate world. With teams like Special Forces requiring the work burner to be running red hot, there is always an opportunity cost. Gaz rarely saw family and friends outside the military, but he maintained these relationships by nurturing them when he could, like returning from deployments. So clear boundaries and the ability to turn burners up and down at different times is really crucial. For the final P, process, Gaz believes that to develop a culture of trust, you must first accept that everyone is flawed. He explains that to maintain high levels of trust as a leader, you need to demonstrate three behaviours. Authenticity, accountability and communication, citing courageous conversations as a necessity to maintain the standards and values your team set. Gaz also explains that there is no substitute for spending time together when aiming to build high levels of trust and believes it's important to value and engineer this within companies. So, in regards to the three action points that we can take from this, in regards to purpose, firstly, understand how to connect your people to your mission and each other. And secondly, communicate your mission and values at every opportunity to avoid people drifting from them, especially in fast-paced stretch companies. Second action point, people. Hire people who align with your mission, values and burners as you have far less time to connect or align people compared to sports or military teams. And the third action point, process. Lead with authenticity, candid communication and high levels of accountability whilst consciously allocating time for team members to spend together. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. In the next episode, I welcome a good friend, Dr. Ben Rosenblatt, to the podcast. Ben has coached athletes to every Olympic game since 2008. He's worked in Olympic gold medal winning teams and for the last seven years was part of Gareth Southgate's backroom team leading the physical performance of the England football team since the very beginning of Southgate's reign. Most recently, Ben founded his own company, 292 Performance, who provide high-performance support to high-performing individuals. In our conversation, Ben breaks down the misunderstanding between art versus science in regards to peak performance, the three crucial components that underpin what deeply motivates us and why we keep going when it's completely ridiculous to. He also shares the advice he'd give to anyone feeling frustrated, overwhelmed or stuck at work and what he learned from one of the most challenging periods of his career. On top of this, Ben explains why, in his opinion, identity eats culture for breakfast and the five most important components of a high-performing team. You can expect to understand how to supercharge your team's motivation for free, how to create a culture which people love being a part of, and how to empower your people to unlock their full potential. 
Thanks as always to you, our viewers and listeners, for watching today's episode and for your ongoing support. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon.